Death at the gates again. All in my name. Can't greet you today. I have a war to win. Hello there, Seraphim17 once again. This is my Wolfenstein, the New Order, Uber difficulty video walkthrough. This is chapter 4 and it's called Eisenwald's Prison. Or Eisenwald if you want to be English and ignorant. This is the first level that you're introduced to the cutting mechanic. Which is on a weapon that's called like the LHK or something daft. I never refer to it as that. I just, you know, it's the laser orangey shooty thingy gun. That's pretty much what it will always be to me. And this is also a mission which you can do a lot of stealth on. But towards the end, it goes balls to the wall action, and it comes to probably the first difficulty spike of the game. And why is there a difficulty spike, you might ask? And that is because of a heavy. It is the introduction to the heavies, and there's a few of them. And the heavies on this game, I can't even convey just how dangerous they are. It's... I don't know, like, there's a part of me that likes it because, you know... This thing is, is lethal and it needs to be avoided. But there's also a part of me that thinks, how are you ever meant to know that? Like, how are you ever meant to recover from it? Because case in point, the very first instance of bumping into one of these guys can be very close. And this is an enemy that at close range will put you on a loading screen before you've even noticed you're dead. That's how fast they kill you. So, whereas the difficulty side of it, I like it because it means here is an enemy that if you make any mistake, you are dead. But then on the, just the person playing the game side of it, how are you meant to know that this thing is so much more dangerous than everything else? And, and by contrast, it makes the other enemies in the game look like a joke. Like, even the robots, even the mechs, even the, he the giant heavies... And nowhere near as dangerous as the, the shotgun, orange, sugar puff suited wankers that, that fire scatter rounds at you. Like, it's unbelievably dangerous. But here we are inside this random Nazi building. And there's a couple of dudes walking around this, this office. And there's a dog directly across from me in that room who's sleeping. I don't know if you can see him on the terrible looking graphics. But... In this room, you can probably skip the majority of this should you choose to. I just like stabbing people, apparently, so I'm going to take them all out. And also, when you kill them, for some reason their batons count five towards your armor stat. So this is a good opportunity to build your armor up for the, the firefight that's about to ensue. And I'm really interested to see what the German version of this game looks like, because it's... Uh, I'm to understand from the, the fleeting amounts of German culture that I know, that images like the swastika and images, well, Nazi images, Reich images, all that kind of stuff are, are not allowed to be shown in, in that country anymore. Uh, I'm not entirely too sure if this is completely true or what the, you know, the nuance of this is because I'm not German and I've never been to Germany, but it'll be interesting to see how this game is handled with a lot of that stuff because a lot of it is, is very on the nose you know, stereotypical Nazi fantasy. So it'll be an interesting game to play, I would suspect, which is kind of frustrating for Germans, I think. And it might be the same in Austria, I'm not too sure. Because as much as it's a nasty and awful and hateful part of history, it's history and it shouldn't be ignored. And this is fiction. This is complete fantasy. So it seems... I'm not going to say, like, myopic, but it's it's just kind of a shame that the Germans and whoever country, you know, all the other countries that censor this way, are losing out on a, on a very interesting spin, on a very dark part of history. Because as bad as this game is in its controversial nature and some of the scenes that people might find disturbing, I can guarantee you, folks, that history is worse. You know, everything that happens in this game, aside from the giant flying robots and the laser guns and the moon bases and everything else, was happening during those times when, when the Reich were about, when, you know, this kind of stuff, when races and people were being subjugated, you know, it happened, it, it, it's real. 
It's not something that's just made up to offend. It's an unfortunate thing that happened and affected every single person on the planet, pretty much. So I just think that I understand why they do it. I think one of the justifications one of my German subscribers told me was they don't want it to incite support for, you know, kind of extreme, like, Nazi rebirth, you know, sect slash club slash just groups of psychopaths, you know, that do their secret little meetings and wish for a, a pure white Aryan version of, of, of Russia, Germany, sorry, and all that good stuff, which is kind of funny, but it seems weak to me for an excuse. Because those type of people will be that way if you gave them a crayon, let alone some, you know, swastikas and a bit of Nazi propaganda. And it seems dumb as well because most of this game is in German. You know, there's a lot of stuff that's written on the world, on the walls, and all the, the little touches and details in the game is in German. So a dumb Englishman like me is playing it, and I'm getting none of the benefits of the satire and the jokes when someone who is German could be reading it and noticing all the tongue-in-cheek, you know, bits and pieces that they've put there. And I just think it's a bit of a shame. And I don't know what you'd compare it to in this country. I really don't. Like, what would be of the same level of maybe offensiveness or dangerous that would be censored in such a way? Food for thought, anyhow. It's, it, is, it is kind of strange. But this right here is another one of the charge points. It looks a hell of a lot like the symbol that you use on Duke Nukem to get out of the levels, the kind of nuclear launch system. But it's a large recharge for your battery, and it does it twice as quick as the single ones, and they're the ones you want to look for if you can get them, because they're super useful. But this is the bread and butter of the prison, this part, because we're going to be doing a lot of stealth, smashing some boxes, stabbing some dudes, and cutting some fences. The thing to note with the, the fence cutter is it has to join. If it doesn't join, it doesn't work. Like, you can't just cut an X and go through the middle of the X, which would be beautiful if you could do that. Instead, you have to do this fucking painting with a mouse bullshit. Which does work for the most, but there are a handful of moments where the detection is not great. Like, it makes me wonder why there wasn't just a generic animation put in there. I suppose it's because they wanted to give the player some freedom of how they cut. But it seems like if you'd have just pressed it and it had done a, a quick square or a quick circle, it might have been easier. But right there, that guy kind of saw me before I stabbed him. And another thing to note here, folks, is the areas where you can walk through that don't involve these fences don't even bother. There are cameras looking at them, and the cameras have this perpetual laser. It's like a, a circulating array of lasers and... There doesn't seem to be gaps in them or blind spots. They just spot you and start shooting you. And those cannons on those cameras can kill you in two to three hits very quickly. So don't even mess with them. When we come back later on, when we've got guns, I think it's about two shots will kill them and destroy them. And you want to do that to make it a little bit easier on yourself. But all we're doing here is we're watching this dude so we can go and give him a quick cheeky stab. And there is a quicker way going through this level, because I'm going to go and check another area that you don't have to. Once you've killed this guy, if you go behind me and up those stairs that I'm now moving away from, it'll lead up to the area where you need to go. There's one more guard up there, and then there's a vent that you go through that leads into the prison. I just wanted to check I wasn't missing any ammo caches or if there was anything over here. That is one of the best things about this game, in fact. There's so much stuff hidden if you want to search for it. So much interesting stuff as well. But the game is just... Oh, I really like this game. I don't understand how first-person shooters could have been around for so long, yet not really challenged or pushed the, the envelope on what, exactly what they're doing. Like... We seem to be so infatuated by this notion of now we've got the controls down and the frame rate down that we don't have to do anything new. And I'm not saying that this game does anything new. It just does it with charm. It does the touches, the little bits of 
of awesomeness that they put in there that makes it feel better. And they're, you know, they're not afraid to do story-based stuff. Like, stories in first-person shooters are the most neglected part going. And the games that are designed around stories are, are your games like your Bioshocks and what have you. And as much as I love those games, the shooting on them is subpar. Like, it's still good, but it's not the same caliber as, as a high-level shooter. And it can't be argued. It isn't. The gameplay isn't as good as the atmosphere, as the fiction, or the characters, or anything. It just isn't. And that's coming from somebody who really enjoys that gameplay. But I have to acknowledge that the shooting doesn't feel as tight or as responsive as other games do. And it just doesn't have that, that level of quality when it comes to precision. This game does, in a lot of ways, and you can really see the the influence of the Starbreeze team that they left. Whereas if you've ever played Escape from Butcher Bay, the Chronicles of Riddick game, you'll be familiar with a lot of stuff happening in this game. Make sure you slide under this, and when you're here, make sure you cut this with your laser. This is another one of those instances with the dog thing that I'm not the biggest fan of. Because it's just a quick time event. The only difference being is, if you don't know it's happening, which how the hell are you supposed to on your first time through the game, it generally involves dying. And it's, it's one of those traps that new players will fall into. And once you understand how it works, you'll probably never die to it ever again. So, trial and error at its finest. It just delays the fun parts of the levels for me. But another game that they made, The Darkness, this game reminds me of the darkness a lot because it has those those features like side quests and little distractions that first person shooters just don't do there's no middle ground you're either a fallout which is way way the other side of the spectrum where there's a million and one things to do there's not even a clear path unless you follow a main objective and you can essentially live in that world which is great if that's the kind of thing that you want and then the other side is your Call of Duties, which is you're on a linear path that couldn't be any more narrow, shooting things in a shooting gallery, which is kind of retreading the exact same steps and, you know, instances that every Call of Duty has had. Tank level, you know, rail chopper level, random, quiet, sneaky sniper level, you know. And thinking back... The controls are so good on those games that the shooting itself doesn't even have to be fun. Like You know, when you think of some of the areas that they have you shooting, some of the instances and some of the, the environments, some of them aren't even that enjoyable. But they don't have to be because the game feels so good. Whereas this has some really fun and really interesting level design and really good gun feel and responsiveness and, you know... Like, player feedback is spot on. Like, watch what I'm about to do here. It doesn't get much more satisfying than that. <laughs> I just stabbed a dude through his bed. It's just... There's a visceral nature to it that a lot of shooters miss. And I do think if we're going to see an evolution of this genre into something different, something unique, it's going to come from one of these, like, Swedish or Finnish companies because they just seem to have this attention to detail. Like, Remedy... I absolutely adore Remedy. I cannot wait for, is it Quantum Break? Because there's just something about that studio where they make games that they love and they love every part of them. And that love, you know, manifests itself in those games as the character that they exude. Because there's always interesting stuff to do. There's always like little hidden bits and, and interesting like Easter eggs and such. But it's, it's the side quest thing that I'm really excited for. That door right there, by the way, is the lockpick door that you do when you save Wyatt instead of saving Fergus. So the list of the differences I've noticed so far is instead of getting health upgrades with Fergus, you get armor upgrades. And the lockpicking slash door breaking stuff is gone from being connecting wires to picking locks. That is literally the only difference I've seen so far. Oh, and... Instead of having the crazy math lady, there's a black dude who's kind of like Jimi Hendrix. That is pretty much all the differences I've spotted so far. But the side quest stuff is the thing that I really like. 
you know, m my dream for first-person shooters is is that they can have really compelling stories, they can have unorthodox narratives, and they can have moments where it's a linear, raily kind of shooter sequence, which is all climactic and, and momentous, but it can also have a quieter moment around a, a home hub that you can build up throughout the course of the game. You know, give us the option to do alternative things and interesting things, even mundane things, because that's one of the things gamers want in a lot of ways that I don't think game developers really understand. Like They think by having us pilot a helicopter while it's on fire going through a skyscraper falling out of a frigate that's you know flying in the air into an active volcano on the moon is alleviating any of the notions of it being dull or boring or tired. It's always exciting. It's always boom, 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 boom. But sometimes it's the softer moments. Sometimes it's the, the tedious moments, the more menial moments that are the most evocative. And the reason for that is, is not because people dream of, you know, slow walking around listening to exposition while going into an armory and picking up some ammunition and loading it in your rifle. Like, there'll be some people that enjoy that, like my friend Aiden, he loves anything that's got a strap. To him, if he had to go into an armory, pick a gun and then put a strap on a gun and then strap it over his shoulder, he'd be in heaven because that's the type of stuff that he likes. Those little touches of detail. But it's, it's the pacing of it. It's when everything blows up all the time, you don't appreciate the thing blowing up. But when something is quiet and calm and awesome and brooding, and then all of a sudden shit blows up, you have contrast. And contrast is what makes it work. And without contrast, you have Call of Duty's campaign, which is a nail-biting, white-knuckle ride of constant stimulus, which all feels underwhelming because you've seen it before and after a while you solemnize it in your brain and boom it's not exciting or white knuckle or jaw clenching it's just oh another explosion that knocks my character off his feet and removes me from the game which that's something I, I, I can't wait to be rid of just the control and the feel. Like one of the things I love about Starbreeze and I love about Machine Games now, who are the new studio that have from people who are ex Starbreeze guys, is that they keep you in the first person perspective. They they commit to it. Watch this. I'm like, stab the dude, Jesus Christ. And then he nearly fucking kills me. All because of the detection on the execution didn't trigger, which as you can see, it nearly got me killed, which is a bit of a shame. But what I mean by committing to the first person perspective is they keep you in the character, they, they exude the fact it's first person. When you do stuff, you see his arms, you see stuff happen to his hands when they get covered in blood. They keep you in the perspective and Monolith are the only other developer that I know that do this with the same fidelity. Like when you're climbing ladders, you see the animation of him reaching for it, you see him doing things. They keep you in that perspective, they keep that immersion. And not enough games do it, and I'm hoping that the extension of this in a few years will be that we're even more in it. For instance, when you get knocked down in those cutscenes, maybe you get to still control in those cutscenes. Maybe you get to respond and react and have a part of it rather than feeling like a spectator. I'm not entirely sure what form it takes, but there's obvious there's room to grow, and it's exciting for anybody that has a passion for, for games. So thank you for watching, and as always, you take care.